Hello, I'm Jancy McPhee, and I'm the Executive Director of SciArt Exchange. Welcome to Design Your Habitat. Today we're talking about science fiction and superheroes and their relationship to our usual reality and our not so usual reality right now. And we have a wonderful guest today, creator and writer Mickey Fisher. He has an incredible list of successful sci-fi shows, including Extant and Reverie with major TV networks and producers like Steven Spielberg. He also has been able to work on some major space related shows like National Geographic's Mars, produced by Ron Howard. Wow, Mickey, we are really lucky to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. So, Mickey, let's just jump right in. How did you get to be such a cool sci-fi writer? <laughs> you know, I always tell people that my earliest memory as a human being is going to see Star Wars. Actually, it's a kind of a toss-up. It's between one of two things. Either like when my the day my parents brought my youngest sister home, I was three years old. I, I have a vague recollection of that day, but then my most earliest vivid memory is sitting in the theater watching Star Wars with my parents. And so I feel like, and then as a kid, I was obsessed with it, had all the action figures, would play with them, make up scenarios uh, in my yard. And then as I got older, uh, when I was in the fifth grade, I got the chicken pox. Actually, I think it was in the fourth grade, I got chicken pox. And my dad, while I was stuck at home in quarantine, very much like we are right now, uh, he bought me the whole set of the Lord of the Rings books. And then every morning yeah. before he went to work, he would read a like some of the book with me. And then when he would leave and then I would keep on reading. And so I finished over the course of a couple of weeks, at, you know, as a, as a fourth grader, uh, the, like the Hobbit and some of the Lord of the Rings books, kind of a lot of my, on my own. And it was, you know, painstaking because they're very dense books and there's a lot of mythology and a lot of characters, but I just fell in love with the fantasy aspect of it. Uh, and then, you know, that's, I, that's really interesting because I'm wondering, because we also read those books. I remember reading The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. I wonder which books are the, the most inspirational for all of us who turn into science fiction and space lovers. So that, it's just interesting that you chose a book that I also remember from my childhood. I'm sure that if you ask a lot of you know people who got interested in science fiction, you would find those common denominators. I think another one was uh, the Wrinkle in Time series, Madeline Langle. Those were pretty in heavy rotation when I was a kid. Um, and then comic books, like I was a huge comic book kid. I would go ride my bike to the store around the corner and buy as many comic books as I could off the rack. And I would come home and like sit under the tree in the yard, and just read comic books all day. And that's uh, that's kind of how I, I got, so I really feel like those were very formative years of my education. And then when ET came out, uh, I think it was in the fifth grade when ET came out and that I went to see it every weekend for a whole summer because it just like blew my mind. And, um, and so those have always been my favorite stories. Well, and everybody loves ET because he, he is such a lovable character. Yeah. I have a whole shrine to him over here on my, on my bookcase. I'm going to show you in a little bit when we have, if we have a tour of the office, I'll show you. <laughs> That sounds awesome. I look forward to that. So has writing always been your thing? No, in fact, I, what's interesting is I always, I always love telling stories, but really it started with acting. And when I was in, uh, again, sort of around the fifth grade, I did my first play at the elementary school. I was cast as the lead in a musical. And the only reason I think I was cast as the lead is because I sat up in the, toward the front of the class and I sang very loud. And so, uh, so I got this part and I was pretty good at it. And up till then, I was playing three sports a year. I was playing football, basketball, and baseball. Terrible at all of them. Um, <laughs> and I was never like really, uh, never what you would call an athlete. And then I was, did this play and people were like, oh, this is, you're really good at this. And I think once people start encouraging you and it, you, it appears you have this sort of natural talent at something and people start encouraging you, people start providing more opportunities for you pointing out things like, hey, there's this audition for this thing you should do. Uh, and then when I was in the sixth grade, I saw a, a thing in the paper for an audition for a community theater show at the theater across the river in Ashland, Kentucky. And I went after football practice in my football jersey, you know, dirty, sweaty from football practice and saying happy birthday with about 50 other kids in an audition. And I was cast in the community th theater show. And then I kind of never looked back after that. And so from then on, up through high school, through college, I actually went to school for musical theater 
And then while I was at school for musical theater, I started writing more seriously. And then by the time I graduated college, uh, I really wanted to be a writer as much as I wanted to be an actor, if not more. And then gradually found that I was a better writer than I was an actor and certainly more disciplined at it. Um, and it was, I had much more of a passion for, I could sit by myself and write for eight hours a time. Um, but I couldn't force myself to really like practice music and go to auditions like my friends were doing. So, and that's, that's an important point that we talk about a lot that it's really excellent to have diverse experiences. You know, you, you explained how you, you were, you were working on the sports, <laughs> yeah. but that you also had other things you're interested in and, and that you ultimately followed your passion because I think pulling all of our skills together and, and following where our heart leads us makes us more motivated to, to do whatever it is we set out to do because nothing is ever an easy journey. There's always something along the way that is making it a challenge. Yeah, I think there's a, uh, one of my favorite bands is this band called Dawes. And they had an album that came out a couple years ago and there was a song on it. And the, one of the lines in the song is, you're going to quit a lot of things until you find the thing you won't. And I feel like that is such a, a truism for, for life in general, and relationships and all that stuff. And I think, especially when you're, you know, if you're a student and you're 13, 14, 15 years old, you're trying all these different things. You kind of like being in the band. You kind of like art. You kind of like science. You kind of like music. Uh, but then gradually, like, you find that one thing that, like, you just can't stop doing. And it's just a part of you. And then you combine all those interests because, you know, you're pulling together your natural interest in in science and space and doing creative writing to express your your thoughts and your visions so yep. that that's kind of like a, a good option for me to ask this question that i know we here at sired exchange get a lot of different opinions on you know we hold these major international contests about the future of space exploration and look for all these different forms of artwork about that future and there's frequently a big difference in opinion about whether or not the artwork should be realistic or whether it's okay that it be fantastic and maybe not quite possible. So where are you on that, that whole spectrum? What's your philosophy? It's so interesting. I, uh, I'm kind of all over the place. This probably is going to be like a really satisfying answer because I think all of it is necessary. I feel like I, the kind of science fiction that I write mostly like with both extant and reverie were what they would call out here in Hollywood, like grounded science fiction, sort of near future. Um, and there were sort of just a leap five minutes into the future. There's a technology that, that may exist, self-driving cars. Like in extant, we were doing like self-driving cars and we were already, you know, doing, doing like much further sort of exploration space. Uh, and then we had these very lifelike androids that we called humanics and that, that artificial intelligence was developing. And so I think that is very different than something like, say, like Guardians of the Galaxy, which has a, you know, talking raccoon and a tree, you know, all this kind of stuff too, which is a little further out there. Um, but I kind of think all of it is necessary. And I think they serve different functions. To me, Guardians of the Galaxy is such a, like, a, a adrenaline shot to, like, my enjoyment and my inspiration and really getting you to think outside the box. Um, and then other things like the, the near future stuff can put, you in the, uh, can put you in the mindset where you're able to start asking the questions like what are the big sort of moral and ethical questions about how we're going to be dealing with these things in the near future. Uh, like say right now like uh, gene editing and like uh, that sort of thing. Like there are some really big questions like how much should we really be able to, to – uh, change like if we have a if we have a kid, should we be able to decide go in there and flip some switches and decide that they're going to have like blue eyes or dark hair and more you know like um, there are a lot of big questions about it. and science fiction I think is uniquely poised to help explore those big questions. Um, so I kind of feel like we need all of that. We need the people who are really thinking ahead in the future and really really like opening our minds to the potential of what's out there, um, and then the people who are saying like here's here are the things that are coming super fast down the highway that we're going to be dealing with soon. And I, and I agree with you. I think there's a time and a place for all those different formats. And I think one of the interesting things about the more sort of fantastic type of storytelling is that it, it does make suggestions about what could be. And maybe what could be seems completely unrealistic. 
but maybe there's someone out there who's a kid now, but in 10 years after being inspired by what could be, will be able to actually create it as a realistic thing. And one of the examples, yeah, one of the examples we have right now is, you know, I grew up in the days of the original Star Trek, and we solved all of our medical problems by assessing everyone's body with a tricorder, this, you know, <laughs> little handheld thing that would read all of your vital signs and then post them up on this little plaque behind the patient. Well, ironically, we're working very hard to try to get something sort of like a tricorder right now for our long duration space missions because we, we not everyone on, on a crew in their confined habitats is going to be an expert medical doctor and yeah. they need to be able to read the symptoms and send the reports with a delay, depending on how far they are, to some of the experts that might be at home or be able to look at the data and make decisions based on kind of a guidebook. So there's, you know, there's a lot that, that we get from these un, currently unrealistic views. I think there's, there are a couple of things that just made me think about that. Like one, like Dick Tracy, was, that comic strip that was around, I've probably like from, the, at least from the 50s, maybe back in the 40s and earlier, um, where he had like a wristwatch communicator. And now with Apple Watches, we have that. And the Apple Watches are a medical device. They actually can do, uh, I think there are EEGs or something like that too, where they can monitor your heart rate. They can alert the paramedics if you, you, know, you fall down or are, are out for a while. And then there's a real push to turn our phones into more of a telehealth device where there are certain things that you can do to, uh, to you know, I have a Bluetooth thing where I monitor my blood pressure at home and then it goes to a, a service to monitor. So I, it's all that stuff was... The, the, that's not very far from what the tricorder was. And, and how many times do you have one of your friends and family members say with excitement how many steps they did today? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. My mom um, and I talk about it all the time. <laughs> yeah, I have a friend who told me that since she got a dog, she's walking nine miles a day. That's wow, pretty that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned what your favorite sci-fi books were, but do you have a favorite superhero? Because, you know, they're, they're, they're not the same but there's some relationship between these super characters and these science fiction characters. You know, interestingly enough, I think my favorite superhero straddles the line between the two because it's the incredible Hulk. Yes. And there is a, there's a heavy science fiction component to it. And, and all the way going back to the very first science fiction story, which is Frankenstein. You know, I feel like that's, you know, if there are a lot of people who feel like that was the very first, you know, that Mary Shelley wrote the very first science fiction story in uh in frankenstein and so there's there's a real correlation there between the incredible hulk and i think that i always liked is i was always like a big kid and there was something like he didn't know his own strength and his own size and i related to that uh, very much but I also because the tv show was on when i was a kid uh, i also just felt really sorry for him because people would pick on him and pick on him and then finally he would just like you know lose control and turn into this big green monster and then he could and he could do whatever he wanted. And, I, and uh, that, that was always, but then I, that was always felt very sad for him. But then I was kind of excited to see the bad guys get what was coming to him. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting that, that you talked about the fact that's, that these superheroes not only give us kind of hope for the future because they're amazing and they're helping us to overcome something that we need to overcome. But also there's always enough in the character that many of us can relate to those superheroes. And I'm part of a group of scientists and engineers, women, who are part of what we call the female superheroes of science. And we actually go and talk to young girls um, in elementary school and middle school and we talk about what we think is our superhero trait but also how our journey has not been always perfect you know we may look yeah. like amazing engineers and scientists now but actually we had challenges and then we usually end those se sessions by encouraging the girls to identify their own superhero inside of them what are you now or what might you want to be and it helps them to visualize themselves being the person that they want to be and feeling empowered so there's a lot lot more than just fun behind both the sci-fi and the superheroes oh, that's awesome what's your what's your superpower i'm volta <laughs> yeah cool 
And that's, that's based on the fact that I am a neuroscientist by training and also I'm working on creative science right now. So that's, that's how I present myself. And you know, we have, we have a lot of fun doing it, but it's also a great opportunity to share our journeys with a lot of people and encourage them to follow their passions. Great if it's in science and engineering, but really just like you said in the beginning, just find your passions and have broad experiences and, and be a creative person, whatever you decide to be. So I'm curious. What do you think is going to happen when we do finally come out of this social distancing period? Uh, what, what if, well, let's start. How has our quarantine affected how artists and, and, and art practitioners are doing their craft right now? And then having thought about that, how do you think this time period is going to influence future art? Well, I'll tell you that what's the first thing that I saw that made me realize what we were heading into a really different era for this um, in this time period is really the first weekend that we were in quarantine here. Um, I got an email from my college. I went to school at the, the College Conservatory of Music in Cincinnati, CCM. And every year, the musical theater department and the acting departments, they send the, the students, the seniors to do a showcase in New York. And then the drama program, I think also does, they do one in Los Angeles. And the showcase is you, you create a show together with your classmates and you take it to New York and you perform it for agents and managers. And it's really like the first big step in starting your career off in one of these big cities. So what happened this year is that they, um, they had to cancel it in New York because, because of the, the quarantine and the virus was spreading. And so I got an email from my college Saturday afternoon saying, we're going to have to cancel this, but we're going to do it live stream today, this afternoon, if you can log on and watch it uh, and support these senior students who've worked so hard. And, uh, and so I did. So I logged on that afternoon and I watched a live performance on Facebook with a bunch of the other alumni from around the world. And we were all commenting at the same time and, and, and talking and like cheering these kids on. And, uh, and that was the moment I was like, oh, this is, we're going to be doing a lot of this over the next few weeks. And, and then I did, I mean, I, at then I thought it would just be like two or three weeks. Now it's been, you know, six. Um, but then I had other friends who were doing a live stream events and uh, live concerts. We've seen a lot of musicians do concerts from their living rooms. Um, Disney did a live sing along on network television that had all these different artists working from home. Uh, I did a live stream reading of my play that we premiered in Houston. Uh, we did it. And so it's kind of bridging the gap. It's not television. Even though you're in your home watching it, there's still a live component and there's still an interactive component where you're talking to people uh, around the world. Um, so that's one thing which is interesting. So theaters, live theater in general is really having to pivot the hardest, I think, because um, it's about people in seats and, you know, bringing a couple hundred people, a thousand people together in a venue. And there's that live electric performance, that thing that you can't quite uh, get anywhere else. And so that they're going to get really hard. Uh, television is moving to like virtual writers rooms a lot. So typically when you create a television show is a bunch of writers get in a room, you talk about the stories and the episodes, you're all kind of coming up with it together. And generally you're all in one room in a conference room talking all day long. Uh, so now that's moved to Zoom, kind of like you and I are doing today. Uh, but I'll tell you what's really been fascinating to me, um, what has been one of the, the he real heroes of the quarantine, uh, uh, is something like TikTok, where like ordinary people are just like creating their own stuff, creating viral videos. They're bringing their parents, their grandparents, they're teaching them dances. Um, people are telling stories, doing just doing really creative stuff. And I feel like there's been this real burst of creativity where people are coping by just like creating and having fun and, and, and being together. And uh, so I don't know, I think that's gonna be interesting. I think that'll have a ripple effect down the line. And, and I think that maybe there'll be sort of new art formats because what's happening kind of now is we're having virtual art hackathons. You know, we're creating art virtually and out of necessity, I think if you're actually recording the product, you have to keep the number of players in your art down because with delays and yep. all of that. So I, I had a friend whose daughter is getting a theater degree and they had 24 hours to respond to a prompt and create a short play. And normally they do that in person and they have, you know, whole teams of 
actors. They had to limit themselves to two actors because with, you know, freezing and uh, issues with the internet, there was really no guarantee that you could get anything to work without two two actors, with, with more than two actors. So it, it was really interesting and the products were really cool and that was a little bit different. So I think it's, it's gonna lead to some changes and hopefully some of them will be really, really fun. So what about topics? What's our future sci-fi and fantasy gonna look like? I have to tell you that I feel as though my current reality is actually stranger than most of the fiction that I have read in the past. And it's it's a little bit daunting. So do you think our, and you know, we're not gonna hold you to this, but do you think that our future near-term artwork is all going to be very apocalyptic? Or do you think everyone's gonna be tired of that and really looking forward to things that divert them from thinking about scenarios that are confined and isolated like what we're doing right now? I think it'll be a mix of both. I think that, I think that it'll be as different as there are artists who gravitate towards certain things. I think there are certain, uh, that this will filter and process through some people in a way that they will, in, it will cause them to envision uh, a, a world where something like this happens more more and more. By the way, what's interesting is uh, I think there are a lot of lessons for storytellers and writers in looking around at the way that it affects all the little details of your life. Like for instance, you know, going to the grocery store, seeing people in masks, uh, that, that's changed daily reality. Like I went to a Sprouts grocery store the other day and there was a person in like a full like gas mask kind of thing. And that felt very apocalyptic. Um, it affects all the little details. Like you pass stores and churches and all the signs are about, you know, praying for people with the virus or maintaining social distance. And, uh, and so really like if you're a storyteller who's telling one of these things, you can look, there's a, there's a lot of um, uh, educational value in just looking at how it's permeated every facet of life. Um, but we were talking about this yesterday, like one of the fascinating things is in all the dystopian fiction that I've read, and then she to say like, you know, the Hunger Games or uh, all these sort of things, nobody's ever talked about like a shortage of toilet paper. You know? So like there, there are always going to be details that like nobody gets right. Uh, and wasn't the other thing that, that kind of amazing of all of the things for people to get really worried about? Here in the United States, it was largely toilet paper, yeah, which I like, think is hilarious. <laughs> it's so interesting. And it really is like speaks, it, it kind of goes back to speaking of like, what's the mindset? It's the stuff that you really have to dig one layer deeper to uh, when you're imagining these things that um, to, to, to sort of bring that, bring that reality up to uh, when you're world building to really fill out those details. But then I also think there are people who are going to, who, to gravitate the other way and audiences who are going to want things that are just more fun and more escapist and more, uh, you know, we talk about like fantasy a lot that uh, as a, a means of escape. And what's, what, what's I think great about fantasy, what's great about the really sort of fantastical science fiction, the space operas and things are that they're, they, they still put you in the, in the shoes of characters. They still make you feel empathy for what they're going through. They can still uh, have these sort of like core messages at heart. Um, and uh, that are more universal, I think, to all of us. And they're not necessarily about the dangers of artificial intelligence, but it's more like, how do you be a good person? What's, how do you, valuing your family and your friends and your connections. If you look at something like Harry Potter, you know, the, you know, the, the, the core of those relationships and like being willing to put yourself in harm's way for your friends at a moment's notice. Uh, those things are all universal. So I think we're going to see a, lot, a, a need for a lot of that stuff too as we go along. And, and I think that these experiences we've had are telling us a little bit about our reality, just like, like you were saying, you know, some of us in some ways have been brought together. We're all having dinner together for the first time. You know, we're all stuck in the house and we used to eat at different times and now we're eating together. And some of us may even be realizing that there are pros to being isolated. You know, you can totally set your own time of day and your own pace. And I think all of us are coming to appreciate the power of technology. Absolutely. And I, I think for some of us, it's connecting us and, you know, and, and for others, it's, it's, it's having the opposite effect. It's not quite good enough, not quite the real thing. 
And you, when you and I were talking earlier, you were also talking about and referring to a lot of the things that that were effects on on the planet from from this time. And yeah, if, it, if you think about, it, I, I I follow a lot of these articles that are well. For one, the first one that really hit me was uh, that Los Angeles has the cleanest air of any major city in the world right now and uh, how because, often does that happen <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's happened in the last you know 75 years um but there are all these you know videos of like a you know, herd of wild sheep that have overtaken a town again now that people are off the streets there we've seen a lot more coyotes in the parks here things like that too that nature uh dolphins that are returning to ports because the ships are uh are all are all docked and all that kind of stuff is interesting, but I do think there is a, an impact on the, there's definitely going to be an impact on the planet. And that's going to be the thing that I think a year from now will be really fascinating when all those studies come in to look at what, what was the impact of this time of just all of us taking a moment to, to let the earth breathe for a second and stay inside. And there's also an impact in, in us thinking about our habitats too. You know, what, yeah. what is it that we really need? What is it we don't need? How could we design this better? And I, I think you also had some tips to share to help people as they get through this more isolated and confined time, even as we start to lighten up the restrictions a little bit. And I thought maybe you could share some of those with the people listening. Sure. You know, one of the things that when I was working on uh, the show Mars on Nat Geo, the episode that I was really, uh, that was kind of handed to me that was sort of mine to carry throughout the writing process was really about the, uh, the effects of isolation on this small crew that was going to be the first crew on Mars. A very small number of people, you know, five or six people. And uh, so I started doing a lot of research and researching like the high seas program where they basically quarantine a uh, you know, group of astronauts in training and really study the effects on them. And they have, they're, they're away from their families for a long period of time. They can only communicate uh, in, in Mars to earth time. So they can send a message and they have to wait for the response. Um, they can't just FaceTime. And so uh, and studying the psychological effects on that. And one of the things that I did in the episode was the one character was, was he's just like driving another character up the wall and or just about to come to blows in a very tight, confined space. There's a lot of stuff, cascading problems, things that were going wrong. Um, and the, and the, the doctor who was also a partner to this, to the person who was starting to like lose their mind a little bit, uh, talked them through a visualization. They had created something that the person could use. They would close their eyes. They would imagine a place, the happiest place they'd ever been, you know, a moment that, um, that they were the happiest, they were at calm, they were at peace, um, and then kind of creating a mantra around that and describing the place and what it, what it sounds like, uh, what it smells like, what the air feels like on your skin. And so it was really about, um, and so for me, like that place would probably, if I'm just thinking now, would be uh, on this glacier in Montana. I hiked up like three miles to this, to this glacier and, the, and you're up there and the air is so crisp and clean and I can hear the wind through the trees. I can put my feet in the icy cold water, you know, of the glacier. I can smell the mountain air. I, it's all that stuff I can see the show. So if I were gonna create that, I would create maybe like 10 sentences and I would close my eyes and I would just really imagine that and put myself in that place. And, um, and so I think that that's one um, way. It's, it's a form, a lot of people do meditation and I feel like that is a, a form of the same kind of thing. But, but if you find yourself getting stressed, to imagine yourself, to visualize yourself in, in the place that you love the most. That isn't your home. <laughs> right. Because you're here now. <laughs> so, and you know, this is a good time to ask you just a, a little bit about what is your creative process? How do you come up with these great ideas? I'll tell you something. What's fascinating to me about this time, what I've learned about myself is how much of my creative process, when I'm just sort of starting a new idea, is tied to me wandering around outside. So I go hiking, I walk the dog a lot, um, I go to coffee shops, I tend to write in coffee shops, I go exploring, I drive around aimlessly to new neighborhoods and listen to music. And all that time, like my subconscious is churning away. It's, it's things I've been, I'm really, uh, I'm a big believer in this, this sort of idea that creativity is really the, I, the act of like drawing connections between things. 
And so as a creative person, one of the things I, I do is I take in a lot of information and stimuli and I'm constantly reading articles and books and listening to music and looking at artwork. And I'm just sort of constantly f pulling stuff in and, and then letting my subconscious connect those things. So for instance, we'll talk, I can talk to you through like the show Reverie. So when I created Reverie, I had a little bit of time off right after Mars and I've been reading a lot about virtual reality and how companies like Facebook, they were putting all this money into, into VR for, with the hopes of getting people like us to spend more time there. And I'd never really played with it. So I ordered Google Cardboard. It was like $20 I ordered from Amazon. Came in, I put my phone in and put it up to my eyes and looked around and all of a sudden I was standing at the base of the Eiffel Tower. And I was in my apartment in Glendale, but I was looking at Paris and I was looking all around and then I could go to like the pyramids in Giza. Um, and I had this thought, this sort of the game you play as a writer is what if this? And I started thinking about what is it going to be like when this gets so good that we can really create the world that we want to live in. You can design and build the world of your dreams. And what if you could bring back people that you lost? Like you have a loved one who passed away. They have, you have hundreds of voicemails and videos and thousands of pictures on their social media feeds that you can recreate that person digitally. And then you can be with them in this virtual space. Okay, well then who would ever want to come back for that? From you know, like we we might be in big trouble as a species because people are just going to want to live in this virtual perfect virtual world they've created. So that was the what if that led me to the show. And then the next question is, well, like, well, how do you get them out? And so that the answer to that question was, well, you need somebody who can go in, who can convince them, somebody who's really uh, adept at making a connection quickly. And that kind of person to me was like, oh, that's a hostage negotiator. And so I started doing things you like doing a lot of research about hostage negotiators. And so those those two, like all those sort of disparate ideas came together in the show called uh, called Reverie that really was about like the danger of technology, but also the how it can also um, bring us together, how it can connect us. And that can also reveal deeper things about ourselves. So there was it wasn't like dystopic, but it also wasn't it. You know, it was, there was a hopeful message to it as well. And, um, and I th uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Sorry. So, and I think that you actually had a creative idea to suggest to people to try while they're in their isolated and confined habitats right now. And it had something to do with dreams. And behind yeah. me is a painting by Daniel Chang. It's a poster called Infinite Dreams, so I thought it was an appropriate one to include today. And it was from our Project Mars competition with NASA, and you were kindly a judge for that. So thank you again. Yeah, you're welcome. There's so much, I, by the way, I love that poster. And it really is, I'm looking sort of over your shoulder, and there are books on the floor, and like a half of a book. And if you look around, like in my office, there's like books stacked on this cooler. I have my bookshelf over here i have a pinball machine that is like i play that a lot for just fun but i have books on these tables and like open notebooks everywhere so that really uh resonates well well done artist that is uh very much a creative space so um, he, he captured your habitat <laughs> he definitely captured my habitat and i have like all kinds of toys and stuff too like i said i don't know if you can see this i'll give you a quick look at this too but like that there's the um that bookshelf has a lot of my favorite inspirations like if you start at the top there's a yoda up there uh the et board game there's my, uh, an action figure of my dad is Mad-Eye Moody from Harry Potter. <laughs> there's awesome. the Matrix. There's, e there's my Amblin shelf with Gremlins and Jurassic Park, E.T. There's a Twilight Zone shelf. There's a Star Wars shelf. So anyway, yeah. So like that's all. This is the, my sort of fun creative space too where I come for inspiration when, I'm, when I need it. Um, but hey, about, your, about the idea we were talking about, one of the things that's been also fascinating to me about this is how it's affected my dreams. And I've had a bunch of conversations with people and, and have been reading articles about how quarantine is affecting the way that we dream because, you know, normally you're going about your day-to-day -day life, you're going out, you're having interactions with people, you're having a bunch of conversations, you're taking in a lot of stimuli, whether you go to the grocery store, you go, uh, you're, you're having a conversation with your friends and now all that's cut off. And so you're stuck in one place and then also you're, you're having, you're in survival mode. So you're constantly thinking right. about the virus, you know, that stuff in. And it's really affecting the way a lot of people dream. Some people are sleeping less, some people are sleeping more. So it's, it's turned people's routines around. Um, and so I found one of the first nights I had a dream that I went to a, a wedding of a friend of mine. And instead of a reception, he had created a murder mystery 
where he wrote a character for all 200 guests at his wedding. And we all had to play characters. But I remember in the dream being like, this is a huge crowd. And I think that a lot of people have had dreams about being in crowded spaces. Um, and some people have had very uh, vivid dreams of being, like I had a friend who uh, had a dream about being in a stadium that, and all of a sudden she realized everybody in the stadium had like the coronavirus and she had to get out. Another friend, uh, another friend who had a dream that he moved to Iceland because he knew it would be safer there. And, um, and then another friend who dreamed that he was in this very strange city that was a combination of modern architecture and ancient architecture. And there was this totem pole that went up like up to the heavens. Um, another dream of this, this young woman who was in a wheelchair and her dream was that she was trapped outside, knew she had to get back in because it wasn't safe, but she couldn't get upstairs because there were stairs and she was in a wheelchair. And so I think that like, this is really bring up all this like crazy stuff from your subconscious uh, mind. And so what I thought might be interesting for people who are listening to this for the students is um, going back to that idea that creativity is about connecting things and that you're, and it's so much about your subconscious, uh, keeping a dream journal, a quarantine dream journal for like four or five days. And, and you kind of have to do this the first thing to wake up. Like, I don't know about you, but when I, if I wait, if I don't tell somebody or write my dream down, if I wake up and start going about my day, I'll totally forget it. So you wake up, roll over, write down some crazy thing that happened in your dream. And then after a few days of that, pick something, uh, an idea, an image, and create something based on that thing that your subconscious mind is, uh, is, is pulling out for you when you're asleep. So this would be an excellent way to start creating those ideas for that future sci-fi and fantasy work and all based on, on things that are happening now. And I, I think that's a really, really cool idea. And I, I hope a lot of people pick that up. I, I think I'm going to try it. And it'll be fun. It'll be fun. And, yeah. My girlfriend and I have been doing it for the last few days because I was talking to her about this. Uh, but so every day now we wake up and we talk about like, what's the weird thing that happened in your, in your quarantine dream last night? And where did, and then sort of asking yourself, like, where did it come from? You know, like, how did that, what, 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 where did it pull that out of? <laughs> so are we going to see some future sci-fi from you that's related to some of those dreams? Have, have you identified a couple that might be winners? You might, you might. I, I, my process is that generally like all sort of goes like in this big churning, you know, it's like a cement mixer back there in the back of my brain. And then I never know when they're going to come out. It's, it's so funny. I'll be writing something and then uh, a, a, a question will come up and I'll realize like, oh, the answer is there. I had a dream about it six weeks ago. I'm not one of those people. I've never had the experience. Like they talk about Mozart and some people where, you know, he wrote an entire symphony in his dream. And I've had very few of those. Although I will, I'm trying to think the one I had last week, I was telling Julia, I woke up a I was like, it never, this never happens to me, but I had an idea for a whole story. And basically the idea for my story was, a sort of Edgar Allan Poe-ish, was uh, a guy goes to visit his friend, two very rich people, say like Elon Musk and Richard Branson. Let's say Elon Musk is going to visit Richard Branson. And he goes and visit Richard Branson on this island. And Richard Branson has, over the years, collected exotic specimens of the most like beautiful, brilliant animals of each species and he's got them all in cages right and so he's having dinner with you know with his friend we'll, we'll take it away we'll make it like two fictional people having dinner with this with this new friend and he's explaining like yeah so i collect the most perfect specimen of each species and then they get to the end of the tour and there's an empty cage and it says homo sapien and then the friend realizes he brought me here to keep me as the representative of that specimen. Ooh. So I had that, <laughs> I had that whole dream uh, in uh, that whole story in one dream. Uh, and I woke up and uh, so yeah, it was like, he was the, he was the human in a, in a zoo of perfect specimens. So. That, that sounds like a, a future, future story to share right there. Yeah. And we look forward to that. Thanks, and thanks. But by the way, if somebody else wants to write it out there, you want to create something based on it, go for it. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for talking to us, and it's been really fun to hear your perspectives and your experience and how these times are affecting sci-fi and fantasy and, and how sci-fi and fantasy affect our future realities. And great idea on an activity for all of us to try and a couple of tips for us to help getting through everything. So I just want to sum up and say thank you so much for everything. Thank you. This was so much fun. Thanks for having me. All right. You take care, and I'm looking forward to that story. Thanks.